Welcome to the next uh, the next stop in our 500 million year rapid fire tour through the evolution of animals getting up towards us. Well, we probably won't really have time to get up towards us, but we'll at least get up to the dinosaurs. That is my promise to you. So today we've got a lot of ground to cover, about 200 million years, or rather not actually a lot of ground, a lot of water to cover. So we might as well get started. If you remember where we left off last time, we started in the Ediacaran roughly around 650 million years ago with the very first animal communities emerging. And they're very strange things, many of which have no clear relationship to things that are alive today. By the end of the Ediacaran, by the end of the Ediacaran, we get the first examples of skeletons being built, the first examples of predation, as well as examples of organisms moving around on the seafloor. So we've got motion, we've got things attacking each other. That gives rise in the Cambrian to a spread of biomineralization. More and more things start building shells, things start moving in more complicated ways, they start burrowing into the ground. And by the mid-Cambrian, you've got a place that you would recognize as a marine community. You wouldn't recognize any of the individual things, Almost nothing that existed in the Cambrian is still around today, at least in a form that's similar to what it was like. Uh, but you would recognize all of the all of the classes of organisms, the groups. So this thing here is a giant swimming arthropod, but I mean it's playing an ecosystem role like a fish does today. Right? And these things here are playing ecosystem roles like crabs do today. Totally unrelated or largely unrelated, but they're performing similar things. You've got a similar kind of diversity of organisms hanging out within uh, within these communities, or not diversity in terms of number of species, but in terms of the occupants of different sorts of niches, right? This is, this is a pretty fleshed out community, but not as fleshed out as a modern community, as you're going to see in a second. So this is where we got up to. Right here is where we start building up. Let me make a smaller line here. Right here is where we start seeing, you know, the very beginning of uh, the emergence of animals. Not animals per se, although perhaps sponges back here, but certainly evidence of embryos and things like that. As we move through the Ediacaran, though, we get the first animal community showing up. And then as we move through the Cambrian, of course, we've got that explosion in terms of the major phyla, the major groups of organisms. So what I'm interested in talking about today is this whole unit of time right after here, the majority of the Paleozoic. So this is what we are looking at. And here are the timelines. I haven't updated this. This is a time scale from a couple of years ago, so the exact ages are not quite right. I'm not going to ask you this anyways. I'm interested in you knowing what is happening in the early to kind of mid Paleozoic, what is happening in here. So that is what we are interested in. All right, this is what we are going to focus on over the next two lectures. So don't get freaked out here. We've got 12 topics. Sure, we've got two lectures to cover it. And I'm going to divide them roughly into not time intervals, but rather we're taking a what's happening on in the sea versus what is happening on land approach. And so the goal for today is going to be talking about mostly the marine stuff, except we're going to save this thing over here, the Devonian extinction, to next class. So let's get going. What's number one up? Number one up is the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or the Gobi. So this is a continuation of the story that we saw in the Cambrian. In the Cambrian, we get the emergence of all of these major groups of organisms. So for example, here is the mollusca. What are the mollusca? These are everything today from squids to snails to uh, squids to snails to uh, octopuses, right? clams, all of those things are, are mollusks. So we probably have at least the, the precursors of mollusks down in the, in the, Cambr or the Ediacaran, but the first really clear ones show up, the proper, what we'd call crown group mollusks, show up in the Cambrian. And in fact, all of these things, all of the major groups of life seem to have their first proper appearance in the Cambrian, with the possible exception of one group called the Bryozoa, who might not show up until the, uh, until the Ordovician. So this is what's happened in the Cambrian, is that we have a huge increase in what we call disparity. For anyone who has been in, uh, in, in biology, disparity doesn't mean to be sad. We're talking about the difference between organisms. So how different is this organism from this organism? So the broad groups are appearing. But the actual number of species that exist on Earth 
are nowhere near in the Cambrian what they're going to be in the Ordovician or certainly what they are like today. So that's where we are in the Cambrian. So the great Ordovician biodiversification event then isn't the appearance of all of these major groups. Rather, it's an increase in the total number of things like species and genera. So if you guys want to read an overview, there's an article, and all of these hyperlinks are going to be live in the PDF I put up online. This is a really recent overview of what's actually going on and how it differs and how it's a continuation of the, of the Cambrian event. Here is, uh, this is from a different paper, 2009 paper. This is running through. Here's the Cambrian, here's the Ordovician. These are family level, right? So this is quite a high level of biological classification. And what you can see, I've outlined the edge right here of the, uh, I've outlined the edge of the Ordovician. Here is the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. Let's make that a little smaller right here. And you should see that although we had, you know, a clear increase in the number of families go through the Cambrian, the rate of increase dramatically takes off in the Ordovician. And then note that it more or less plateaus all the way through until we get to this giant mass extinction event over here. And then a weird thing happens. After this giant mass extinction event, it comes back, it gets to the former plateau, and then it keeps on going till today. And we'll revisit this portion of the story later on. But right now, we're going to be talking about this portion, in particular, this portion right here, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. All right. So here is what is happening. Here is your explosion of body plans. This is your disparity, your main groups appearing here. And then over here, we've got an explosion of biodiversity. So expect if I asked you something like contrast the Cambrian explosion, a great Ordovician biodiversification event. What I want from you in a short answer question is Cambrian explosion equals disparity, right? So the main body plan showing up. Great Ordovician biodiversification event equals diversity, total number of things like species and genera massively increasing over here. And this is in the Ordovician. So here is the Paleozoic Plateau, and then you've got these extinctions. We're going to talk about these two extinctions now. Next week, we're going to talk about these extinctions over here. All right, here is a uh, diagram showing that really this event is not an event at all in the sense that it is not a single thing. In fact, it's made up of a series of major changes. So the first portion of it is this planktonic revolution. So you start getting a huge increase in the diversity of things floating up in the water column. These are the base of the, of the food chain, the things that are going to support things like fish and giant arthropods. So they explode in diversity and abundance over here in the beginning of the Ordovician. And the cause of that isn't clear, but it's probably, uh, it's probably things like changes in uh, ocean chemistry, oxygen levels, temperature, the total amount of sea level change, the amount of, uh, of uh, flooded platformal areas. And we'll look at that in a second. The real increase, though, in diversity, you can see, doesn't actually happen until we get to the middle all the ways over here to kind of the late Ordovician. And what you're seeing in here is an increase first in things like uh, the organisms living on the bottom, so clams and their equivalent, more often things called brachiopods, which are kind of the Paleozoic equivalent of a, of a clam, and then reef communities over here eventually as actual proper reefs with real coral, not just those strange archaeocyathens, but actual proper coral takes off over here. So the first thing I want to point out is this is not really an event you can see here. This is a, you know, tens of millions year long, slow and progressive increase. Now, on a higher resolution, you'd see that this is not a continuous rate of, of increase, that there are a series of kind of stops and starts. And it's debated amongst the community how much this is a series of discrete events, how much it's a continuous ramping up of, of, of diversity. You know, that's beyond the, uh, beyond the level of this lecture. And, and really, we haven't made up our mind as a paleontological community yet. But the bottom line is there is a dramatic increase throughout the Ordovician in the total amount of diversity going on. And it's at least partially caused by changes that are uh, in the inorganic components of ecosystems, things like more oxygen, things like an increase in sea level, creating more you know, habitat for things to live in, perhaps changes in temperature, all of that stuff is definitely going on and playing some role. But the majority of the story is probably just a continuation of what we saw in the Cambrian itself. Here is, uh, this is reefs, and you can see there's the middle. Really, it's the middle and the late is when we get the ramping up. We get some in the some in the beginning here, 
That's this continuation of what we were talking about. So what is actually going on in terms of the organisms? You do not have to memorize these. I'm going to ask you some things about these uh, main groups of organisms later on, but you're going to have a lab where you actually look at pictures and interact with models and things of these things. But there is this increase in diversity. A number of these guys are new groups, not in the sense that, you know, this is, uh, these guys are uh, the same group that includes things like starfishes, these are the echinoderms, but crinoids proper don't exist until we get into the Ordovician, right? Things like uh, graptolites, right? That we have primitive versions of them back in the Cambrian, but the ones that are floating around in the water column become really important. They don't show up until we get into the Ordovician. So we get a number of these things here, particular representatives of things that if you look at any rock really through the Paleozoic, you're going to find representatives of these things. These are different kinds of critters in terms of the specific families in that than what we saw in the Cambrian. So they're a continuation, but they really are, they look different. If you look at a community from the Cambrian, it is different in terms of who occupies it than the ones in the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian. The other thing, though, is that these guys are just much more complicated. The things are bigger, there are more complicated ecosystem interactions. And this is a whole different environment, both in terms of overall what's living in it, but also the complexity of the interactions than the Cambrian right here. So you see things like this, and you don't have to know these particular organisms. These are brachiopods. They look like clams. They're not actually clams. These are bryozoans. These are actually related to brachiopods. You can find them actually today. If you go up in Nova Scotia anywhere, you find seaweed. Pick some seaweed up and look for seaweed next time you're up for a walk that has kind of white patches on it. If you look really closely in the white patch, you'll see that there are these little kind of divots growing on there of this kind of calcareous material. That's actually an invasive species. It's a form of uh, bryozoan. I forget what it's called. Uh, and each one of those little pits that you would see would have a tiny little filter feeding organism on it. So these guys were major components of marine systems in the, uh, in the Paleozoic. They're less important today. Crinoids, these are essentially giant stalked starfish. They're st uh, starfish sitting on big towers like this. I mean, not literally, but they're relatively closely related. Corals, the proper first corals show up in the Ordovician. And these are the two big groups I'll show you in a second. These things are consistently throughout pretty much the Ordovician. We see these things uh, until we get to the, sorry, throughout the Paleozoic until we get to the Devonian. Uh, and these are the two big groups. Anytime you pick up really any limestoney environment in the Ordovician, you're going to find one of these things. I have bags of them in my uh, in the lab. You can come by and I'll probably even give you one if you come by and you're nice enough. Uh, the graptolites, these are the area that I studied. Okay, so what's driving this stuff? Uh, again, it's still an open question. We've got, this is a, a, a diagram uh, showing here's your increase in diversity. And we've got things like, notice that although it is overall, this is degrees Celsius, overall it's quite hot throughout most of the, uh, the Ordovician, right? There is a steady decrease in temperature and that decrease in temperature correlates pretty well with this increase over here. So maybe there's some kind of climate driver on diversification. Uh, you know, this is a suggestion that uh, that climate driving, this, this drop down here is maybe being driven by an increase in, in dust from this major breakup of a meteor. Right? There's a bunch of these arguments that are going on. Uh, I'm not super interested in trying to dissect what are the geochemical or, or climate kind of uh, triggers pushing these because those are contested. They're also less important ultimately than the ecological interactions. So really what's going on here is a story which is a continuation of what we talked about in the last class, which is that as organisms show up, they drive diversity. So more species equals more species. And how does that work? Because these guys are modifying the environments. They're modifying them both by physically changing the environments, you know, doing things like uh, building, you know, building physical substrates that things can live upon. So now you've got a hard environment, a coral reef that also changes how waves interact with the shore because reefs act as wave breaks and that creates quiet areas behind them that other things can live in. And things that are going through and recycling, uh, that are recycling, um, you know, material which is coming out from the upper parts of the water column, little fecal pellets are coming here and they're coming down into 
you know, into the benthic realm. They're coming down into the ground and they get recycled by scavengers. And all of these interactions between these various things create opportunities for specialization, right? And they literally are changing the physical environment, but also in their interactions together, you know, where one thing is eating another thing, which then specializes so it doesn't get eaten. And then the thing that eats it specializes in eating it to the point where you just start driving through this hyper-specialization, you start driving diversity. So this is the same kind of story we talked about last time, where more diversity begets more diversity, right? A spiraling kind of, uh, of a spiraling pattern of complexification of ecosystems driven by the organisms themselves. That is probably the largest thing that's, that's, that's driving this, this Ordovician event. And this is a continuation then, really, of what we saw in the Cambrian, if you think about it in that way. So you can see this same kind of pattern we saw where we had organisms getting larger and reaching up, swimming up into the water column, but at the same time burrowing down deeper into the substrate, therefore bringing oxygen with them. That continues on where things get bigger, they're swimming around more, but they're also burrowing down into the ground more. And you can see this actually in the organisms themselves. So we've got things like uh, these crinoids here and they get big. Like some of these things are, are getting pretty close to tree size. You know, they're getting 10 feet tall. You know, here's an example of my favorite big organism. So remember that in the Cambrian, the largest organism was Anomalocaris here. This is a one meter long swimming bug. This thing, on the other hand, seven meters, that means this thing's about 20 feet long. There's a scuba diver obviously there for scale. This is a thing called a nautiloid. Right? This is an orthocone nautiloid, and it's essentially a, a giant squid that lives inside of a shell. There's uh, the nautilus. You've probably seen nautilus shells uh, for sale. The nautilus is the only living relative of these things, but they got massive in the Ordovician. Uh, this is a, a quick little video here. You know, reconstruction. These are Eurypterids. These were uh, other um, swimming arthropods from the um, crawling and swimming arthropods from the Ordovician. And here is a reconstruction in CGI of the giant orthocone. This is a fun video. This is uh, made by the BBC. Uh, it's called uh, Swimming with Sea Monsters, something like that. Swimming with prehistoric beasts. Here he is cruising along. There's our Eurypterids. There's uh, Eurypterids on land here. Anyways, you can check this video out, but it's pretty fun, right? This is a this is a big creature. Is the point? Here's some more Canadian biggest. Right? Canada has a lot of biggest firstists. We got a lot of estus, right? So this guy here is the largest trilobite known. It's from northern Manitoba. If you want to see it, it is in the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum. And this thing is, I mean, it's three quarters of a, of a meter long. This is two plus feet long. This is a really large organism. Given these things are normally, normally a, a trilobite is kind of as big as that scale there. They're about that big. This is a huge organism. And it gives you an idea of what the ecosystem has to be like to be able to support these things. Um, this is maybe my favorite example, uh, one of my favorite examples of big things. So you remember Anomalocaris? Well, there were, which was a, a predator, right? Here you are, here's your super predator. He's got that big scary mouth. It's called a patoya. I'm never going to ask you that, but if you want to know. Anyways, this is a, another Canadian find. Actually, maybe it's from Greenland. I don't remember. It's, a, it's an Arctic find anyways. Uh, so this thing here is a modified version of that appendage there, which was used to grab organisms. Except if you look at the fine details of this, and there's the actual fossil itself, what you see is these are little hair-like filaments that would be useless for grabbing, say, a trilobite, but would be great for sweeping through the water and grabbing plankton. And so this guy here is a, an example of a... Uh, of an early filter feeder. But what I wanted to show you is this Ordovician monster over here. I love this next guy. Uh, this critter here, and if you click this link again, you can see this is a two meter long beast. And if you look down here, this apparatus, there's the actual fossilized version of it right there. There's the fossilized version. These little hairs that are coming off, this thing is functionally exactly the same as baleen. So there's baleen, which is what's inside a filter feeding whale, something like a humpback whale or a, a blue whale. They have this baleen structure. Look at the structure of this thing here and look at this thing here. Right? This is how it would have been arranged in life. So again, these things are completely unrelated, but it's a fantastic example of convergent, uh, convergent evolution. This thing is from Moroccan. It's an early Ordovician creature. Um, 
It's uh, something like Ejiro Cassis uh, Ben Molai. Ben Molai is named after the uh, after the Moroccan man who actually found the uh, found the this specimen. Anyways, I love this beast. You can click on the link if you want to read more about it there. All right, so let's move along to point number two, which is the evolution of reefs. So you remember that when we were in the uh, Cambrian, we get the first kind of substrate building organisms in the sense of we have things that are building really small mound-like reefs, the Archaeocyathids. Well, real reefs take off in the Ordovician and they reach their peak in the Devonian. So if you look at reefs today, I mean, this is the Great Barrier Reef all along the edge here. This is something you can see from outer space. So you remember though that in the, uh, in the Paleozoic, huge parts of the world's continents were functionally, you know, covered by water, which meant that these kind of reef communities were capable of moving all over and you could build reefs up over here. And in fact, we had carbonate, you know, platforms with large scale reefs covering large portions of the of the continents. I mean, these are they were producing reefs on a scale that just don't exist today. And I'll show you that in this image right here. So this is a shot from the Rockies in Alberta. This entire, let me just highlight it for you here. This entire structure you see right here, let me go back. This entire structure you see right here is a giant reef mound. And this is the kind of thing you might get in the Bahamas or something now. I and mean, this would have been an island, you know, sticking out of the water at some point. Uh, well, not sticking out of the water like that. I mean, part of the sticking, you know, shallow in the water. Anyways, this just gives you an idea of the scale uh, of these uh, of these reef complexes that are forming in the uh, in the Ordovician beginning, but he, he, uh, hitting their kind of uh, heyday in the Devonian. So if you look at this diagram right here, if you look at this diagram right here, here are the beginning. These are our Archaeocyathens here, the beginning. These things are not really true reefs, the reef mounds. And then coming in the Ordovician, we have this expansion reaching its maximum, literally in all of history, its maximum point during the uh, Devonian. And these are made up of, uh, of, of stromatoporoids, but most importantly, they're made up of corals, they're made up of corals. And if you are collecting fossils in any, really any locality in, uh, in the Ordovician, Silurian, or Devonian, you can find things that look really similar to these fossils right here. These are chain corals. These are the most common, uh, the most kind of characteristic example of the group here, the tabulates corals, or the tabulata. And then down here are the rugosins, or the rugose corals. And they are most characteristically formed by these things that look like this. Right? They're called horn corals because they look like the horn of a sheep. And they've got these, you know, radiating septa that look like spokes of a bicycle inside. You can see right here, there's the, there's the septa right there. And then here, uh, these are the tabulate corals. No, sorry, this is a tabulate coral. If you were to see a cross section of one of these, what you would see, if this is the top, the opening here, is you'd see they have a series of these almost like platforms within them, which are called tabulata. You can see them inside. Anyways, that's beyond what you really need to know for the, uh, for the in the lab, I'll have you look at that stuff. But anywhere you go, you're gonna find one of these guys or something that looks like this if you're looking in kind of limestone in the environments. These things were super abundant, super prolific. So this is the age of the, of the reefs, really. All right, point number three, high sea levels, abundant black shales. And these are interrelated ideas. But when I say high sea levels, I mean really high sea levels. So most of the Paleozoic, or at least kind of the early and mid Paleozoic, sea levels are relatively high. Right here is a sea level curve. Right, we're down way over here now, uh, as well as, uh, as well as temperatures are relatively high. And these are obviously interrelated because if temperatures are really high, then you've got no ice caps. Where does your ice go? Well, the ice goes you know, into the water, which is gonna raise the sea level. But the other component of this is that you've got active tectonics, which are driving this. Remember, we already talked about in class on a long term, when you've got, uh, when you've got rapid seafloor spreading, the ocean floor literally floats higher on the mantle and that forces water up onto the continents. The other thing is that when you smash, you know, plates into each other, you build mountains. You've got these orogenic events, and those mountains are necessarily higher than the flat ground was before tectonism. So where you've got uh, where you've got um, active tectonic activity going on, right? It can 
uh, either cause, when they've got subduction, material to rise up out of the water, or alternatively, if you don't have any subduction going on, if you don't have any subduction going on, then it's going to cause, but you've got lots of spreading going on, as these things are you know, moving apart. This is a plate, and they're moving apart like this. They are going to be relatively young, because the lava is forming new rock right in the middle of the ocean here, and this whole thing is floating up higher relative to the surrounding uh, relative to the mantle or relatively what it would be when it's old. And that's going to cause then, if it's sitting up higher, it means that the average depth of the ocean is going to be lower. And that's going to force water up onto the continents. Anyways, you've got these flooded continents. And when I mean flooded continents, I mean really flooded continents. And so as a result, you get these widespread deposits of largely what we call platformal sediments. And a lot of these are going to be limestone. These are going to be carbonate sediments. If you guys have been to New York State or you've driven through Ontario and you've seen the side of the highway, most notably kind of around southern Ontario, the Kingston area is really obvious, all around Belleville, if you know that area. All of the sides of the highways you drive through, you're going to see are made of these stacked layers of kind of light gray rocks. Get out of your car. I mean, don't stop on the highway, but if you get out of your car and take a look, you're going to see that they are full of all of these organisms I was talking about earlier on. I mean, this this stuff we saw up here, right? All of these, all of these creatures we saw. Where are they? All of these creatures we saw somewhere. These things, all of these things. You're going to see these things all just popping out of them, massively abundant, massively abundant. Okay, so this is what the sea levels would have looked like as we moved through the Cambrian, right? We had still large portions of, this is just showing the North American continent. It's not showing the other ones over here. Remember, we're calling this Laurentia right now. And so here's the Cambrian. We've got parts of it flooding. Notice this thing over here, Dashwoods. And we'll talk about this later on. This is a, you know, you've got active subduction going on. This is, this is being brought closer to the mainland over here. By the time we get to the Ordovician, We've got, and this is the late Ordovician in particular, we've got most of large parts of the continents covered in shallow seas. And shallow seas, uh, and these are going to be hot seas as well, reasonably hot seas, the shallow tropical-ish seas. These are fantastic environments to build up diverse fauna, right? Corals and, you know, trilobites, all of these kinds of things. This is the Silurian, right? They we're, we're losing some of our... Uh, some of our oceans, but we've still got a lot. Now I'm going to notice over here. Here's some foreshadowing over here. Notice that where did our where did our dashwoods go? Well, our dashwoods has accreted. It slammed onto the side here. And notice what's coming along here. Look at these words: Gandiria, Avalonia, Maguma. We're going to come back to these guys in a second. So I skipped by it, but I want to go back to this slide. This is a paper by Murphy and Nance, and you guys who watched the, the video uh, on the Atlantic, the, uh, the CBC video, you've met both of these characters. Um, Brendan Murphy is from St. Effects. He's got the giant hair and the giant beard. Anyways, this is a paper they did on the breakup of, of continents. But what I wanted to show you here is, is their, their correlation of rifting, so breaking up of continents and subduction, and how they're correlating them here with the sea level curve. I also want you to note the, the seas being relatively high throughout the entirety of the Paleozoic. This is the Paleozoic here. This is the boundary between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. And then a progressive increase back up over here in the Mesozoic. But you can see that there are, uh, there are uh, uh, points where it's moving up or down. But otherwise, we've got relatively high, but correlating with what's happening on a tectonic level. So that's, again, a theme that we visited earlier on when we were talking about climate. Okay. Let's move on beyond here. Here is our story. So we've got, again, mostly flooded continents. The other thing that's going on is that because the, uh, because the oceans are relatively hot, because they're relatively hot, we don't have the same degree of circulation that we used to have uh, or that we currently have in the oceans, which brings you know, oxygen-rich waters from the pole and sends them down and you know, these giant circulation belts we were talking about. And so during the Ordovician, we had large scale intervals uh, during the, the late Ordovician and actually the Silurian in particular as well. We had large intervals where large portions of the deep waters of the oceans became anoxic and built up black carbon rich shales. Whenever you have black carbon rich shales on a widespread level globally, that's telling you something super weird has happened, what we call a global anoxic event. Anoxia just means without oxygen. And so these, these shales that were building up 
or evidence as well that we've got uh, something strange happening in terms of the world's oceans. And it's related, we think, in large part due to these high temperatures, also potentially to nutrient flux due to the evolution of, of really simple plants. And I'm gonna circle back to that idea later on. All right, so here's the Devonian, and you can see what's happening with the Devonian, right? Well, we've now we've got big mountains. This is the, these are the Appalachians. These would have been like the Himalayas at the time. And so a huge portion of the, of the earth is actually getting exposed over here now as we start to jam more stuff and build big mountains over here. But we still have relatively deep uh, relatively deep ocean, certainly in comparison to today, right? So we have, you know, the prairie provinces, most of the interior of America would have been underwater. And so you still find Devonian, you know, find Devonian fossils, marine fossils all through the states, all through large parts of Canada as well. And then suddenly you get this, and this is going to be next class. So this is serious foreshadowing here as well. And these guys are also foreshadowing for a couple classes from now. Remember those names. I'm not going to make you see them on a, on, a class, on, a, on a test, but the story I will ask you to tell me. So by the time we get to the Carboniferous, we've lost this ocean entirely, but we've also simultaneously lost most of the ocean that used to cover the continents. This is, these are very different worlds. This world and this world here are very different worlds. And as you can tell by the coloration that they've done here, that green, that's not arbitrary. The world has really fundamentally changed in an important way. That's foreshadowing. We're coming back to that. But I want to now just move on and just talk quickly before we go about black shale. So this is a paper that actually my supervisor wrote, Dr. Mike Melchin at St. FX. Each one of these black spots here is an area where you have marine or where you have uh, black shales. This shot here, number five, that's actually my thesis locality up here. And you can see it's retaining them to some degree. The white spots here, these are areas where you're getting uh, relatively oxygen rich environments. And so what you can see are these widespread anoxic localities. And then as we move into the mid Hernanchian, that is the uh, latest part, just about the latest part of the Ordovician, you can see that they've all switched into oxygen rich environments. And then look at what happens. This is the early Silurian, the next period, they've all flipped back to oxygen poor environments. This is a really important story we're going to talk about in a second. But I, I do want you to notice, especially in the Silurian, look at how widespread these low oxygen uh, deep water environments are. And these are the kinds of rocks that are being produced in here. So you can see alternating, these, these are limestones, those are alternating environments where you've gotten you know, short-term climate or short-term ocean changes where you've got you know, more oxygen rich stuff being deposited. But in between these thick layers of black shales, these represent uh, oceans that have gone completely stagnant. And they weren't universal. I mean, you still had environments where you had lots of, lots of coral reefs and stuff, but they were much, much, much more widespread than they were through most of Earth history, especially in the Silurian. And there is quite literally nothing like this in the Earth today. You know, some areas like the Black Sea, you get kind of microcosms of it a little bit. But on a broad oceanographic kind of scale, this environment here with these widespread anoxic, right, low oxygen conditions producing black shales, these don't exist anymore. This is a particularly weird, uh, particularly weird thing that happened only a few times in Earth history. The Silurian and the late Ordovician are a couple of the main examples. So we're gonna add this in as another thing, along with these shallow water seas, the fact that the seas in some areas were completely stagnant on a global level, right? Not all of them, but in some environments, especially off the coasts of continents, were completely stagnant and devoid of oxygen. That's another really weird thing that's going on. Okay, so the final, and this isn't the final, this is uh, the, the next kind of thing in the, in the sequence is the late Ordovician extinction event. So this used to be called the Hernanchian extinction event, but now we understand it better. We understand it actually went over a much longer period of time. So we switch the name to the late Ordovician extinction event. You sometimes see it just written out as the loam or the loamy. I don't even know how you'd say that. Uh, so what is the late Ordovician mass extinction event? Well, there are roughly one, two, three, four, five of these crazy mass extinction events that have just decimated marine, largely marine, but in some cases also terrestrial faunas. So we're going to look today at this one here, right? The late Ordovician extinction event. Next class, we'll talk about the Devonian, and then we're going to round the class off by getting into these big extinction events. So extinction is not is not odd. In fact, extinction is the normal pathway, the normal endpoint of every species. Right? Every species that 
will ever exist will eventually go extinct, including us, eventually. So there are lots of points where the Earth has gone through a serious environmental crisis and it's lost things like 20% of species. We're in the middle of a serious environmental crisis right now. But these ones here are events that stand out from all of that background level. Even the periodic massive climate and you know ecological upheavals that happen, these ones are still crazy outliers. These ones we're talking losing things like 80 plus percent of species. This one here in particular, we lost probably over 95% of species on Earth. These are huge events. So the actual magnitude of these things is a bit debatable. I'm going to use this estimate. Some people say this is an overestimate of about 80% of species lost during the late Ordovician extinction event. And we understand the overall story pretty well of what the cause was. So the cause was definitely not, you know, this is supposed to be a meteor coming in, streaming in and blowing stuff up. Right? That's probably or maybe the cause over here for this one, but it's not a good and not a good explanation. I'm going to get rid of it for any of these ones over here. Instead, we're pretty confident that this one here, and actually probably this one here as well, we'll talk about that next class, these things are caused by climate change. And in particular, cooling followed by warming. So this one here, the Ordovician, is a two-phase extinction. So it's actually prolonged over a period of several hundred thousand years at very least. And we go from a globally warm environment to rapid onset of very extreme glaciation. And with that comes a whole series of effects. Well, if you're building up ice sheets on, in this case, the southern pole on a giant continent we call Gondwana, where does that ice come from? Well, that ice comes from water that evaporates and never makes it back into the ocean which means that the sea level is going to drop. And it drops somewhere on the order of about 100 meters, dramatic drop in sea level. And so that means that those shallow seas all over the continents, they are going away. And with them, everything that used to live in them. The other thing that's happening is that water is getting cooler. And so things that are not adapted to living in cool water, they're going to go extinct. But weirdly, as we kick in ocean circulation, so as we cool the Earth, we start getting these big convection cells where we are bringing you know, oxygen, you're bringing O2 from the surface, if this is water, and you're taking it down into the subsurface through these big convection cells at the poles where it's cold coming all the way down like we talked about. That starts breaking up those weird stagnant seas I was talking about. And that's good if you're something that lives in today's oceans. But if you're something which has evolved to live in a weird stagnant sea, then changing it to an ocean which is more like today's ocean is going to kill it. So this is a really important point to go back to. Remember when we talked about evolution, when we talk about fitness, we do not mean some objective standard. We mean the thing that is best able to survive in the current condition. And so if you were able to live very well in a low oxygen environment and suddenly it become an oxygen rich environment, you're dead. Another important thing we think happened is that more nitrogen became available. And that meant that the phytoplankton shifted from ones that were dominated by blue-green algae or cyanobacteria to ones that were dominated by more traditional actual algae. And everything that ate them then changes. It's like we just destroyed all the grass and we replaced all the grass in the world with something else, with, I don't know, pine trees or something. Well, something can eat pine trees, but not the same thing that was eating grass. And then... When we get to the second phase of this two-phase extinction, we flip back to what the conditions used to be like. And that means that all the species that have evolved now to live in these more circulated oxygen-rich environments, you know, these colder oceans, they now suddenly plunge back into warmer, more stagnant oceans, and they go extinct. Right? So you get well, you extinction on both ends, both during the cooling interval and then in the subsequent warming interval afterwards. So what is ultimately causing this glacial event and then the flip back to you know, warm conditions, we don't really know. So it definitely involves a drawdown of CO2, just like adding CO2 is going to cause warming. But whether that's the result of erosion, right? so the weathering of silicates, whether the result of the weathering of a large igneous province, whether it's the result of enhanced uh, weathering on the surface and fertilization of the ocean from first land plants, we don't know. These are all still open questions. And you guys can switch into paleontology and, and work on the job here. We're, we're not done. It's a big argument that's going on. So we'll talk about this one in a second. This one we're going to talk about next class. And this one we'll also talk about next class. 
All right, let's move on to the next slide. So here is a, a moment for digression. I just want to talk about my own thesis for a second. So this was my thesis was on the Ordovician mass extinction event. If you guys want to destroy your minds or enlighten yourself, you can read my horrible 600 page theses over here. Uh, but I wanted to just tell you, show you how we actually generate this data. How do you make you know these stories? My little tiny contribution to the story, how did it come to be? Well, here are the creatures I study. So these are things, these are called graptolites. So these things are living up in the, in the water column and they're living, we think, in a relatively low oxygen environment. They're also adapted to relatively warm conditions, most of these things over here. These are the things that show up in the middle of the mass extinction event and they take over the world. And these things used to live up in relatively colder water, higher north, higher latitude conditions. And so you get this migration that happens with these things coming down. We also think these things might have been adapted to live on the kinds of organisms that live in potentially more, uh, potentially more kind of oxygen rich environments. So you've got a shift in the kinds of organisms that are occurring. And then after the mass extinction, these are the things that evolve to take over the rest of the world. If you want to read my thesis, you can go through it in more detail. But I wanted to show you how we generate this stuff. So here is uh, where my location is. This is my where I did my field work. I spent two summers up here. If you guys, this is the Yukon Territory, way up here. This is Dawson City, Jack London, White Fang, uh, you know, famous Gold Rush City. I'm way over here, and this is in the middle of nowhere. You can see there is, there's, even from space here, there's no, no habitation almost at all here. So this is helicopter ride, the only way, or you can actually, there's a highway that goes up here. It's a beautiful highway. The Dempster should drive along it. So I'm way up in the middle of nowhere. This is my field locality. The only way to get in here is by helicopter or by canoe. Or if you're me, my first year, I went in, well, I'll show you. So here's the airport. This is the Dawson City Airport. It's just this one building. This is hilarious. This is the baggage claim area. This is where you drop your bags off. This is how we got up to my field site my first year. I hitchhiked up and I got a ride just by coincidence with David Suzuki's son. For you guys who know who David Suzuki is, it's kind of funny. We dropped off and I built myself a little raft and I floated down the river. Don't do this for field work. Okay, look at the backdrop here. You see that white color? Those are carbonates. So I told you that we had a lot of shallow water limestones. We also had a lot of black shales, depending on where you were on the earth in the Ordovician. So you can see this right here in the background. There's my boat. There's my boat the second year. There's my field locality. And you can see this as we go along. This, by the way, there's a mountain goat. You see these alternating black shales and limestone, black shale and limestone. So these are probably short-term, very small flips in, in climate, maybe orbital changes, those sorts of things going on. But this is what all of the rocks are looking like. This is classic kind of Ordovician strata. Here's your limestones, your carbonates, and here's my locality. This is my field assistant at the time, this is Allison Atkinson. There is the boundary right up here of the Silurian. That's the base of the Silurian. This right here is the important thing I wanted to show you though. There's my field assistant, Allison. And here is the black shales moving up through as we go through the late Ordovician. And then right here, this transformation to limestone is telling you two things. And it's telling you that the ocean has warmed up. And it's also importantly telling you that sea level has dropped a lot. And so that boundary right there is this late Ordovician uh, mass extinction related dramatic drop in sea level. It's recorded and it keeps on going all the ways up here is all limestone until we hit this kind of point just a little bit below here where it flips all the way back to black shale. And these are these weirdo Silurian black shale conditions. So you go along like this where it's like black shale, black shale, black shale, black shale. Then you should see the color shift right in here. This is the shift as the sea level drops, things warm up. Right, you go to carbonate environments, and then all this is black shale again. Right, this is all this strange environment. So here we go from these oxygen poor conditions, flip through. This is the dramatic glacial interval right here. And then we flip back to the old conditions. So we had extinction right in here. And then we have extinction again, right in here again, really hardcore extinction. This, by the way, is what the end of that field season looked like. So this was another, it spent me almost 10 years. I spent almost uh, looking at these things under a microscope. And this is the story here at the end result. You can read the paper. This is one of the papers that came out of it. This is not just my locality. It's a bunch of different localities that survey around the world. And here's, these are species diversity moving through. And you can see we go up and that's the mass extinction event. Just a dramatic drop down to essentially, essentially no species left. 
This is a paper that came out in 2015. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I wanted to show you what's going on here. This is the latest Ordovician moving up here. This here, each one of these, this is sea level, right? So this is, uh, this is sea level where you've got sea level falling, sea level rising, sea level falling, sea level rising, sea level falling like this, jumping up and down, right? As these ice sheets are building and going back and forth. And this is the really big one. This is the one that, uh, that really hit things hard, that where we flip into the, into the limestones, that one where I was showing you, that's this interval right here. But I wanted to show you this over here. You see these little numbers going back and forth? These are Milankovitch cycles, inferred Milankovitch cycles. And what I wanted to show you is this correlation between sea level rise and fall and the Milankovitch cycles themselves. So these Milankovitch cycles are, remember, always there. They're always there. These are these orbital force cycles we talked about when we talked about climate change. They're always in the backdrop. But just like in the last, our last ice ages, once you get the world to shift into cold conditions, then often you can see them and you get these periodic drum beats of ice age, interglacial, ice age, interglacial, ice age like this. And this was the most dramatic of these ice ages. So these aren't forcing us into cold conditions. Something else has forced us into cold conditions. But once we get into these cold conditions, then these oscillations of those various Milankovitch cycles are causing short-term, you know, relatively moderate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? They're causing that glacial interglacial cycle. Anyways, I just wanted to point that out because it ties into what we were talking about way earlier on in the class. Okay, so what is causing this? So for, <laughs> if you asked me in 2017 what the cause of this was, notice 2017, also notice these are two totally different research groups that are publishing in essentially the same month in two very high, high, high profile papers in two very high profile journals. Anyways, here we go. A volcanic trigger, right? Mercury spikes, a volcanic driver. So what was the story with Snowball Earth? Think way back to Snowball Earth. Remember the story with Snowball Earth was largely, it was partially with the breakup of, of Rodinia, but also is that we had this large igneous province, the Franklin large igneous province, which really rapidly weathers. So as it rapidly weathers, it's going to use up and bind up CO2. So that was the story for Snowball Earth. I'll just call it SE here, Snowball Earth. So for other mass extinctions, we'll talk about in a moment, there was nothing around during here, really, nothing, on, nothing seriously, no animals or any of the kill during the Franklin one. But the idea is maybe there was a large igneous province which was forming, rapidly weathering, and that caused a minor version of the Snowball Earth event. I mean, it didn't actually cause a Snowball Earth event, but it caused catastrophic global cooling. Well, the question is, is there any evidence of a lip? And there isn't in terms of actual volcanic rocks. But we're talking about 450 million years ago. So what are the odds, if this stuff's weathering so heavily away, that any of it was preserved? So the fact that we don't have any of the rocks left doesn't mean the rocks were never there. So this is another example of why so much of what we do in geology is one step removed from the actual evidence. We look at proxies. So in this case, what they were looking for is they were looking at mercury in sediments being deposited in the oceans. And they came to the conclusion that there was a giant spike in the amount of mercury. And the mercury, supposedly, was being released as this large igneous province weathered. So the mercury is coming out of this and going into the ocean, right? The mercury is going into the ocean. There's my mercury there, going into the ocean. And so even though the, the large igneous province is gone, we can still find evidence of it in the form of this enriched amount of mercury. So this was a really good argument, it seemed to be. And this was, suddenly it was a satisfying conclusion to what is causing this. As you'll see in a, in a couple of lectures, we've got evidence of large igneous provinces causing mass extinctions in other localities. So this seemed like a pretty slam dunk uh, story. The problem is that uh, just last year, this new paper came out and we'll see what happens in the papers that come after this. They looked at this data again and they said, hey, yeah, that mercury is there. But when we control for another factor, we find that there's no correlation anymore. So remember, this is the problem when you're using proxies for something. In this case, you're using it for weathering. So they're saying, no, that mercury apparent, that apparent mercury anomaly, it's not actually a real thing. That, yeah, there's more mercury, but that's because these black shales, right, some of these ocean environments, they had more or less sulfides in them. And the mercury was actually getting attracted to this. 
And so the real thing that was changing was just the amount of this material that was in the sediment. It wasn't the amount of actual weathering. That's their argument. So we'll see what happens. But when you take into account this, the amount of sulfide material that's in the sediment, suddenly that whole anomaly disappears. So that story, which was so great, seems to have disappeared. But it could well still be that this is the cause of it, that it's a lip which is weathered totally away. If the lip doesn't stand up and it looks like maybe it won't, then we're back to things that we were looking at in the very beginning. We're back to things like uh, things like um, maybe it's the plant. We'll tell you that story. Or maybe it's mountain building. We don't really know. All right, so that is the Ordovician mass extinction event, a two-stage extinction caused by uh, a rapid shift in climate first to cold conditions and then back and that's the that's the ultimate driver the immediate or the the immediate effect was things like changes in ocean chemistry cooling uh you know loss of anoxic zones or then the the creation of anoxic zones draining of continental seas those are the immediate effect of the long-term thing causing all of this was climate change which was caused by well we're not totally sure all right, now let's move on to number six. I've jumped out of order here, and I want to talk about the birth of the Appalachian. So we live in the Appalachians. If you go to the highlands, that's part of the Appalachians, the very most northern bit. So the Appalachian Mountains now are, you know, relatively low-lying hills. But if you were to go back in through the Ordovician and Devonian, they would have been Himalaya-style giant mountains. They have just weathered away. Right? They've been slowly weathered down to their current position. So let's talk about these guys, because this is our own backyard. This is what we're living in right now. This is a great diagram from that book I put in your syllabus as a recommended reading. This is the 4 billion years and counting, and it's full of awesome diagrams. And again, they're freely available if you want to use them for projects or teaching. So this diagram is showing continents and as continents, each one of these continents is color-coded. So here's Rodinia, supercontinent, these two big continental masses joined together. And here they are splitting up and going on different journeys. So it's showing you the further apart each one of these, each line represents a continent. The further apart they are, right, the further geographically they were apart. So you go across here, and there's that breakup of Rodinia when? About 750 million years ago. Then they came, and then they started cruising back together. And look over here, around 350 million years ago, we build the next supercontinent, Pangaea. But what I want to show you is when they start slamming into each other like this. So here's the Cambrian, here's the Ordovician. And you see during the Ordovician, we start slamming things into, this is Laurentia, this is North America. This whole color here is North America along here. And we start slamming things into the side here and start building a little bit of mountains, the beginning of the Appalachians here. And then we start hardcore building the Appalachians as we move through the Silurian and the Devonian. So that's going to be the story. So there's our Rodinia is a story of breaking up, and then there's a story of everything coming back together collectively. And that's going to take us into not just next lecture, but the lecture beyond that is going to be that real story. So you can see the story on Google Maps. If you look here, you should be able to see that there's an overall kind of sequence of linear features you can see from a map level. If you've ever driven through this, you'll see that this whole thing is a series of ripples that go back and forth. You've got your little car, and you're going to go down a hill and up a hill. I just about destroyed my car driving through the Pennsylvania. And you can see that all along there. Why is that the case? That's because the coastline is made up of a series of continents, little mini continents that got slammed onto the side. And just like a car slamming into another car causes the, the, uh, causes the hood to rumple up, this is causing the continent to rumple up, to literally deform and fault and create these linear patterns here. So you can see this entire portion of the seaboard this entire portion of the seaboard here actually came from away. So, you know, if you're born in Cape Breton, you might say that I am a come from away, but I would say, you know what? Cape Breton itself is a come from away. This whole thing is a CFA, right? This whole thing is a CFA or come from away, right? Boom. Okay. So let us move on and talk about these components. If you look at a geological map of North America, sorry, of of Nova Scotia, what you will see is that they seem to be almost two different things. The kinds of rocks you get up here are totally different than the kind of rocks you get down here. And the line of transition is right around Truro. Uh, that is because these are literally two totally different things. And in fact, this thing up here is two different things as well. So you've got one thing here, another thing over here, and another thing over here. Remember when we talked about Gandaria, Avalonia, and Maguma? Well, guess what we've got here? Guess we've got here, Gandaria, Avalonia, Maguma. And let me show you this. 
So we'll move on down here. This is another map. This comes from Sandra Barr and Chris White. And this shows you that these features, which were slammed onto the edge sequentially, they actually continue all the ways along. So if you look at the rocks right here, you know, in Western Cape Breton, these are actually the same kinds of rocks you see all the ways along here. They continue to Newfoundland, and they actually continue all the ways over to Scotland and Ireland. You can find exactly the same rocks. They were all one continental landmass, a long, skinny thing, something like Japan or Indonesia, that got slammed onto the side of, uh, of North America. So it got slammed on, and then this component got slammed on all this green stuff here. So this green stuff that makes up a good chunk of, remember this is called the Avalon Peninsula? So that's where we get the name from. This is the Avalon terrain. All of this is the Avalon terrain. You go down here, this is the same stuff. These were all one geologic unit. And then finally, this part here, which is called Maguma, you go to Halifax. The rocks down here are not only totally different, they formed in a totally different part of the world. So let's look at their story very quickly. Here is Laurentia and the Cambrian. There's the Dashwoods. This is this first component. It makes up part of kind of Pennsylvania and all this material along here, it comes on and it slams onto the side, building our first mountains around the Ordovician. Here's Gandaria coming cruising along. Offshore over here, you've still got Avalonia and Maguma. They're coming. Here they go. Here they come. And I'm going to note this reconstruction, this is a, it's not a guess. It's, it's one argument. Exactly where these things were relative to each other, this is still an area of hot scientific controversy. Right, <laughs> things get hot. Right, they get uh, they get heated. Right, I mean it's it's in good it's in good fun, but they really are. This is this is controversial stuff. So we know they came from away. They came from somewhere over by where Africa was at the time. We think, and they came sequentially slamming into the side. So here they come, and this is what it looks like afterwards, where they all came in, and by the mid Devonian, as they slam, and they're building these giant mountain ranges. So here is the old, ancient, you know, paleo Appalachians, right? This Himalayan style. These things would have been like Mount Everest stretching up all along here. And here they are in kind of diagram form. This is from Sandra Barr uh, as well. So here is Gandaria, right? So this is the western side of Cape Breton. Here is uh, Avalonia. This is the eastern side of Cape Breton. And then here's Maguma. And they're slamming on. This is North America over here. They're all coming. They're going to slam along. This is where they formed. This is this one model of where they formed off of what eventually becomes Africa. And here they come, they're on their journey. This is where they're forming off the coast of Africa and they all come over here. Now remember, they're not just cruising over. What's actually happening is this oceanic crust is subducting at the same time as an ocean is forming over here, or over here. So you've got seafloor spreading happening here and you've got subduction happening here. So this whole thing is disappearing. With the end result, this gets slammed onto the side. Really don't think about this driving along like a car. This whole thing is a conveyor belt. It's all moving. Because underneath this ocean is rock, it's conducting or subducting underneath as well. And here is a step-by-step -step thing showing the accretion of these components. All right, cool. Here, by the way, is a map. This, this paper was only looking at this component of it here. So everything, I'm going to get my pen. I'll get my pen here. All of this stuff over here, almost all of this stuff over here, this is what we call Gandaria, with the exception of this bit here. If you ever go to Pullet's Cove, up around Cape North, right? This kind of, this little bit here, this is the oldest part of all of Cape Breton. This is a component of the ancient coast of North America. This is the only part which is actually a native part of North America. Everything else came from away. Everything else came slamming on the side afterwards. And this stuff is about 1.5 billion years old, is how old all this stuff is. The rest of the stuff in here is kind of like 650 million years old-ish, that kind of stuff. And it all came slamming onto the side, you know, between about 450 and 350 million years ago. This paper is only looking at here, so there's no detail in either of these sides. But I want to show you all of these blobs of granite and diorite in here. If you've ever driven around Inganish, you know it's all beautiful granite. Well, where's that granite coming from? Well, think about subduction. We talked about this in lab, subduction causes volcanism, right? So here's your mountain, your volcano forming. And the heart of that volcano, the bottom of it, that's your granite forming down here. So this is all caused by subduction as well. This is kind of a glue. As these continents are subducting, they're causing giant volcanoes all along here. And these are just the bases of those volcanoes. The volcanoes have been long since eroded away, but you can see their bases there. So as you move along and go on this summer and check out the Cabot Trail, 
Think about the fact that you're standing on totally different parts of the world when you are here or here, or if you hike to Pullet's Cove, totally different parts of the world. And that as you're as you're checking out, you know, you go to Green Cove and you check out the granites there, or what you're looking at, the Highland Lodge, you see the granite there, you're looking at, you can actually go up and touch, you know, the bottoms of volcanoes that were forming hundreds of millions of years ago as this massive continental collision took place. Okay. That's all we're going to talk about with that. Uh, well, actually, no, one more thing. So this is some, if you go to Newfoundland, you can see, again, as we're building up mountains, what's going to happen? Those mountains are going to be eroding, and you're going to have you know, sediment coming off the side of the mountains. So it is going to be, it's going to be shedding off. And so these guys here are underwater deposits of material, which is building up as these mountains, which are being massively, rapidly built up. They're also rapidly eroding. And so this is, these are oceanic sediments being built up off the course, made up of eroded bits of those ancient mountains. And you can see them also, as they got slammed together, they got tilted up. Remember principle of original horizontality? If you find rocks that are vertical like this, you know they had to have been slammed and tectonically deformed. Well, here they are flipped up on their side. This is St. John's, right? And you can see these things are essentially vertical over here. This is another part of New Brunswick, and you can see them all messed up like this. That's because they've been squished seriously, put in a tectonic vice. Okay, that really is all I'm going to talk about here. So let's move beyond this, and we'll talk about one final idea, which is the origin of Jaws. So I don't mean the movie Jaws, that has its own cinematic origin story. I mean literal Jaws. If you reach up and you touch your face right now, you can feel a jaw in your mouth. Uh, so this is the one kind of big thing we haven't talked. We talked about swimming weird giant bugs and, and squids. We talked about lots of things, but what we have not talked about is fish. So fish are not super early or late arrivals. This is one of my favorite <laughs> slabs of rock ever. This is in the ROM and the, each one of these things, you can see how many there are, like 17, 31, 36, 39, 40, right? This is some kind of mass kill event, just like you can find horizons in, say, the Green River Formation in the States covered in dead fish, and you can buy them at places like the uh, auditorium here in Halifax. These are fish, but they're really ancient fish. So these are from the Burgess Shale. Remember the Burgess Shale? These are Cambrian. So let's zoom in and take a look at one of them. Here's a reconstruction. This thing is super primitive. But here are its eyes, there is its notochord, which will eventually become a spinal cord, and these little gill arches here, right, that's supporting its gills, which is going to help it breathe, and these are the things that are eventually going to be co-opted by evolution. Remember the pimp my ride analogy? And they're going to get turned in, eventually, to jaws. So that story of how we went from something with these gill arches to something up over here, which includes all the things with jaws, how did that happen and when did it happen? Well, we think it happened in the Silurian. So I'm first going to tell you what the original, the old version of the story was, and then I'm going to tell you the new version of the story. So first, here are some weird guys. These are things called astracoderms. Here's our astracoderms, and these are jawless fishes. They do not have a jaw, but they're covered with this super weird armor. And these look like things somebody made when they were high on drugs. These do not look like, these look like Pokemon characters or something. But these were real organisms swimming around. These were the first really successful group of, of fish, but they are jawless, importantly. So these are the astracoderms. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about the placoderms, which are a different but related group we'll talk about in one second. So there's my astracoderms, but let's get some jaws. So here is a diagram showing all the big groups of fish. And I want to point something out. I want to point out that the overall diversity of fish up here, the total number of species of fish, is greater today than it was in the past. But the total number of separate groups of fish that were around in the Devonian were more. So we call this the age of fishes, not because there were more actual fish, but because the diversity of fish hit this high point in terms of how different from each other there are. More total species up here, but more bizarrely different things swimming around in the Devonian. So the overall story was that we had, we thought we had our jawless fish over here, and they eventually gave rise to our jawed fish, which are including all of our modern things, including 
sharks right here. Here's our sharks. And then all of these other things. This is an extinct group called the spiny sharks. They went away. And these are the things that are still around. These things are around only in the form of lungfishes and coelacanths. We'll talk about those later on. But these are almost all the fish came off of this group. And so their ancestor, we think, was probably something like a shark. So it was probably cartilaginous, which by which we mean it did not have bones like a shark does. That was the old story. And so this thing here represented maybe kind of a primordial ancestor of all of the jawed fish, including ourselves, because we're, of course, jawed fish. So these are things called acanthodians, or spiny sharks. And they are Silurian beasts, maybe going back to the Ordovician. And we thought they were the oldest representatives of this group, the nathostomes, which are the jawed fishes. Nope, not anymore. Not anymore. So we got rid of these guys. I mean, they still exist. They're not actually a group, by the way. They're a paraphyletic group. That's something that if you guys have taken biology, you will understand. The rest of you can just ignore what I just said there. They're not a true, a true taxonomic group. It's just a morphological one. Anyways, there's our acanthodians. This was the old version of things. Here's the old version of things. So here are the jawless fishes. This is the ancestor of all jawless fishes here. And so this group here, represents you know ourselves the tetrapods over here but it also represents all the fishes and notice here are the sharks the cartilaginous fishes they are sisters to these guys and so we assume that the ancestor of all of these advanced jawed fishes was probably something like a shark and maybe a spiny shark so that was the old hypothesis then and this is the issue with paleontology is that unlike chemistry we can just go to an experiment we often have to just wait and see what fossils come along, and then we make hypotheses based on those new fossils. 2013, the Chinese described this new beast right here. They'd actually had it for a while and didn't think it was anything important until they prepped it, and then they noticed something super weird, which was this thing is a thing called a placoderm, right? Because it has this armored head. Its head is super armored. This is a group here. And some of the placoderm had these simple kind of jaws, but this thing has a more advanced jaw. It's still pretty simple, but it has multiple components to it. And the important thing was it's super old. So this thing then suddenly becomes the ancestor of all the jawed fish. Now here's where this gets weird. Before we assume the story went, the ancestor of all the jawed fish, remember, was something like a shark. So if the shark, you know, if the sharks and all the jawed fish, all the other jawed fish over here are sister taxa, and the sharks don't have any skeletons, then you assume that the ancestor had no skeletons. And then later on, this group over here evolved you know, internal skeletons. That's the story. On the other hand, if we suddenly stick jaws back here with the placoderms, the placoderms have a skeleton, a partial one, on the outside of their body. They have that armored head. Right? So if we do that, then what do we do with these guys who don't have skeletons? That means they had to have lost their skeleton at some point, which is a pretty radical revision. And it's the kind of thing that has to happen when we find new fossils. We revise our story. So this is the story now that we think happened, right? So here is this new creature over here. Here's this new creature, and it's got a primitive jaw. It's older than the oldest sharks, and it's got a bony head on it like this, which means that the sharks, who lack not only bony heads, but bony anythings, they had to have lost their boniness. They had to have lost their bony. The boniness came from here, right? The boniness came from here, and everything here kept that boniness. But the sharks, they lost that boniness along this branch right here. We think that is the new version of the story. And so this, uh, it was still a bit controversial in 2013. This is the new version of the story. So think back, by the way. Pause for a second if you want. Here's the placoderms. Here are the sharks. Notice that the sharks... Right, including the acanthodians. They are sister taxa for us, the osteichthys. And this whole group here, including, including the sharks, they are sister taxa to the placoderms. And this is the primitive, the primitive thing here, which is a placoderm-like thing. Right? This is now the this is this hypothesis. Okay? So that was still a bit controversial, but then like any good science, if it's true, you can keep finding more evidence of it. And we did. We found two more things that confirm this. Now they knocked out, they knocked out um, uh, Intelonathus as the direct ancestor because we found even earlier things that had more advanced features, but it represents what one would have looked like. And so these are two new ones. And we found another one in 2017. So this is the new story. So a placoderm-like thing was the ancestor of everything. 
sharks and rays and skates and all those guys who have non-bony skeletons, they lost their boniness. Right? So placoderms didn't have totally bony skeletons, but they had some bony heads here. Right? So they had the capacity to at least make bony stuff. All right, here is our final note on the Devonian. This is the age of fishes. Why is it the age of fishes? Because we have so many weird things swimming around. Right? We have so many weird groups swimming around. If you want to look at Devonian organisms, including, you actually can't find these guys there, I don't think, but here's an example of a wicked Devonian fish. This is Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus, you might say, that's pretty scary looking. Look at those teeth. These are not true teeth. These are just extensions of the simple bony jaw. These are things in the Silurian and the Devonian. Right? This is the scale of them. They were massive. Um, here's a video I'm not going to show you of this thing swimming around. If you want to go see the Devonian, the place in the world to see it is in Quebec. This is a national park. It is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You essentially just keep driving north in New Brunswick until it stops being New Brunswick, and there it is. So this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is the place to see Devonian fish. These have the greatest collection of Devonian fish in the entire world are found in the rocks around uh, uh, Migasha. Uh, and we are going to continue that point in the next lecture. That's going to be my foreshadowing because the important, the most important fossil that occurs here is, if not our direct ancestor, certainly well on the pathway to being us. So the next lecture, I'm going to move on land and I'm going to try to start slowly building up things that walk around on land, ultimately trying to build us up. And the a really important component of that story is right up here. All right, that's where we are. Please go and complete the online quiz. Uh, otherwise, I will be posting the next lecture on Thursday or Friday.